embark on the final stage of our journey. The motor vehicles have had to be abandoned at the roadhead, the town of Dibarik, Kathmandu. Equipment and stores for five weeks are entrusted to a caravan of 44 animals and a dozen muleteers, with all the trappings of a century ago. The really exciting thing about this kind of trip is that you have to be totally self-dependent. There are local farmers, but the nearest shop, the nearest doctor, will be many days travel away. After three days, we come out onto the Geech escarpment at 10,000 feet. My guide and interpreter is Captain Gatachu Tafera. Haile Selassie's empire of Ethiopia is easily the most mountainous country in all Africa. It's rather like a, a fortress of rock set in a sea of sand. And the highest mountain massif within Ethiopia is here, the High Simeon, a volcanic tableland which rises to more than 15,000 feet. It's the home of some extremely unusual giant plants, and also some birds and animals that are unique to these highlands. But before we look at those, let me just try to give you some idea of the sheer scale of the scenery here. Crowning all, the loftiest Ethiopian peak, our ultimate objective. Simeon is bounded by this one mighty rock wall of 40 miles. The yawning precipice of the Geech Abyss. To the visitor, the depths are frightening. To a local like the Lamagar, they're a theatre in which to display aerial skill. An aristocrat of the air, on wings nine feet to cross. The escarpment is guarded by offliers that rise like gothic spires from the lowlands. From the foot of the escarpment to the top of the crag is more than a mile. The upper part forms probably the highest sheer cliff in Africa. A stone takes 13 seconds to fall 2,800 feet. Giant Lobelia, 30 feet high. Come on, try it. Outsize Hypericum, St. John's Wort, which here grows to more than 20 feet. You can ride through a forest of flowers. 
They remind me of the tall cacti of North America. Indeed, this whole experience is rather like being involved in an Eastern Western. Chestnut wing starlings prize seeds from among the bracts of the giant lobelia. If ever a yeti is discovered, I feel sure it will look something like this high-altitude primate. The strange gelada baboon, half lion, half poodle. Although confined to Ethiopia, they're fortunately common and live in herds of up to 400 animals. An average female weighs only half that of a male, and because food is neither plentiful nor very nutritious, both have to spend most of their time feeding. The gelada is a real herbivore, a kind of monkey cow. Geladas also root for bulbs. Each morning they leave the cliff dormitory. They've spent the night on lower ledges, safe from enemies like leopards and simian foxes. Throughout the day, they'll not venture far inland from the gorge rim. Their whole life is geared to the cliff, which is also a daytime refuge. Indeed, females and young keep very close to the edge, a kind of women and children first arrangement. Furthest inland, are the all-male groups, composed mainly of youngish bachelors who've not yet acquired harems, and including also a few retired males. Geladas probably live 20 or 30 years. The main unit of Gelada society is the one male group, comprising one overlord, a harem of several females and their offspring. Each overlord has to continually check up on the loyalty of his wives. A lookout has to be kept too for outside dangers. A farmer's dog produces a cooperative defence reaction from the males on the periphery of the herd. In Gelada society, visual signals have virtually eliminated violence. In a moment, this male will make a face, which means, I do not wish to challenge your authority. He's been sitting too close to a wife of this male. The signal of appeasement works and a fight is avoided. A newly born gelada hangs underneath so that it can suckle whether its mother is walking or sitting. The focal point of the baby's life for food and protection is its mother's breast though in a few weeks it starts to venture away. The games they play develop strength and the coordination of mind and body. In a couple of months, it learns to ride jockey style, holding on with its tail. Geladas groom one another for far longer periods than can possibly be necessary just to keep clean. 
Grooming has now come to acquire the additional social function of cementing the relationship between individuals. A sense of contentment appears to be induced. Certainly we know that the heartbeat drops as the whole body relaxes. When aging males lose their harems, they return to the all-male group, where they quietly live out the twilight of their lives, often until their teeth are so worn that they can no longer chew grass. A delightful animal, picking flowers, the gelada baboon, that lives among some of the most dramatic mountain scenery in the world. I'm surprised and delighted to hear a chorus of Cornish chuffs. Common enough nesters in Europe and Asia, their only outpost in Africa is among the peaks of Ethiopia. Another kind of crow, the thick-billed raven, on the other hand, lives only in Ethiopia and nowhere else in the world. It's unique to these highlands where it's among the first birds in it to kill, along with the lappet-faced vulture, the one with the bald head, and the lammergeiers, or bearded vultures as they're also called. The disposal of a carcass may look like a free-for-all, but it's not. There's an orderly progression, the bearded vulture always being last in the queue because its interest is not so much in the meat as in the bones. Once each bone has been cleared of flesh by the other vultures, the lammergeier takes it over and flies off with it. A few days later I come across the Lamagaya's boneyard, a flattish area of exposed rock onto which he drops the bones from a height. This one can't have fallen heavily enough to break it into manageable pieces. This bird is not merely anxious to get at the marrow, it actually consumes and digests the bone material itself. Such is the economy and the efficiency of nature. One day when I've just finished tidying up the camp, I hear a strange cry. It's a simian fox, a shy, normally nocturnal beast, the only individual we're to see in five weeks up here. Like the gelada baboon, it's found only in Ethiopia. Unlike the gelada, it's very rare, an endangered species. The High Simeon is undoubtedly one of the great natural wonders of the world and an obvious candidate for a national park. Already the Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Department have established a small outpost here at 12,000 feet. One of the men who's worked here and lived here for more than 15 months is an American Peace Corps volunteer, Montague Demont. Montague, what are the problems of trying to get a national park established here? Well, the most immediate problem is the fact that we have 650 people living within the proposed park boundaries. And of course, these people need wood for fuel, for building their houses, and they also 
need land to farm and uh, pasture to graze their animals. And this is in direct conflict with the idea of conserving habitat for the species of animals that we find here in Simeon. Montague Demont explains to me that the people have settled this area only very recently, bringing with them large numbers of grazing animals, cattle, donkeys, and also sheep and goats. Even worse than the grazing is the ploughing up of the virgin alpine meadows, and with one very simple result, soil erosion. Each year the people have to farm higher and higher, the barley yield gets less and less. They are on a suicide course, because at the highest levels no cereals will grow. Subsistence farming, worth at most a few hundred pounds a year, is being allowed to ruin a potential tourist asset worth millions. To repair sheet erosion, to re-clothe these rocks with seven inches of soil, will take 2,000 years. Simeon is also being attacked from the lowlands. The forests of giant heather on which many of the animals depend are being cleared by burning. Fingers of denuded land reach up into the highlands. The virgin heather is vital to the natural jigsaw. It's used for shelter by many animals, including Simeon's most important creature, the Walia ibex. And yet, as Demont explained, the villagers are fast cutting it down for firewood. This man is innocent, but his act is criminal. He knows not what he does. But those who do appreciate the implications should act. To resettle 650 people would cost little compared to the priceless value of this unique ecosystem. Why wait for ruination when the people will have to move anyway? I ask Montague Demond how urgent such action is. I'd say that it, it, the, it's extremely urgent. The, the, uh, uh, resources here are, are just about at their end. They're, they're still in the position where they will recuperate if people stop farming. But if they continue as much longer, there's not the, the natural resilience left for the land to recuperate and support wildlife again. Montague, the most important animal here is the Walia ibex. Yes, it is. It's one of the most rare animals in the world. Uh, it's a beautiful animal, as evinced by these horns, which were confiscated from a local poacher. Uh, there are 200 of them, less than 200, and they live on the cliffs, cliffs here in Simeon, and uh, they're very rare and very difficult to see. But I'd like to show you one if I could, Jeff. Searching for Walia with Montague Demont, who's normally rather a noisy character, is like working with a redskin tracker. When he's pursuing the ibex, his whole personality changes. He becomes strangely silent, speaking only when necessary, and then in hushed tones. He can tell Walia tracks from those of other animals, and fresh ones from old. He knows the sort of cave the animals hide up in during the day, and shows no kind of emotion if they're empty. He walks in a special way, avoids sharp movements and keeps below the skyline. At first I find it all faintly embarrassing, wondering if it's really necessary. Certainly it doesn't seem to work, because last night at the end of three days slog we'd still seen nothing. But today our luck is in. A species I was beginning to think must be a work of fiction is fact after all. Five kids frisking about, and an adult female. Montague, who is enormously proud of his Walia ibexes, says we should now find some more. In the excitement of anticipation, we skyline and succeed in frightening off our first male. As if the odds aren't already sufficiently against us, heavy mists roll up from the lowlands.
we startle our male again. Later still, we gain a tantalizing glimpse of an animal Montague says must be a very senior male. He has particularly fine horns. As the days go by, the sheer professionalism of Montague's fieldcraft pays off handsomely. The closest we ever get is to within 200 yards of a quietly browsing female. She has no idea we're here. After 15 months in Simeon, pitting his wits against this highly elusive creature, stalking Walia has become second nature to Montague Demond. These pictures are the first, and could easily be the last, moving record of the Walia in its natural habitat. 40% of the heather forest has already been destroyed in the last five years. A Swiss Ibex expert at the end of a year's study in Simeon, financed by the World Wildlife Fund, wrote to Emperor Haile Selassie, I regret to inform your majesty that this unique animal found only in Ethiopia is likely to become extinct in the near future unless your majesty's government takes effective measures to protect it. The creature is caught in a tightening vice with heather burners below and wood choppers above. The Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Department must act now to rescue the Walia, indeed to save Simeon. A British soldier fighting in Ethiopia under General Napier a hundred years ago said, They tell us this is a table land. If it is, they've turned the table upside down and we're scrambling up the legs. Having said half a year ago we would climb Ethiopia from bottom to top, which has already proved a bit of an uphill task, we feel committed to scale the highest peak. We pack up our battered stores for the last time and cover the remaining 60 miles in three days. In six months, we've climbed from the lowest point in Ethiopia, the bottom of the Danakil Depression, 320 feet below sea level, to this point, the highest point in Ethiopia, Ras Tejan, 15,158 feet above sea level. Between the almost lifeless desert, way down there, and this almost sterile terrain here at the top, we've seen in six programs a range of natural habitats and a variety of animals that's unparalleled in all Africa. None of the animals have yet entirely disappeared, though several, like the Walia ibex, are on the brink of extinction. None of the natural habitats have yet finally been eradicated, though some, like the Arctic alpine meadows of Simeon, are on the way out. Ethiopia, though one of the poorest countries in Africa, is already devoting part of its slender budget to the conserving of its natural wonders. But there must also be a world obligation to help save the wildlife and wild places here for future generations of all nations to enjoy.